I want to thank you all for coming out uh, to be a part of this. This is um, a little bit short notice, but it is and it isn't. Uh, infant mortality is an issue we've been working on for a very long time uh, here uh, in the District of Columbia. And uh, I'm proud to have been around it now for uh, so many years. In fact, I was, some of you may know, I was the director of the Department of Human Services uh, at one point. And it was actually when we started our organized efforts uh, to be able to work on infant mortality. And it's hard to believe that uh, in those days, our infant mortality rate was worse than some of the uh, third world countries uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the world. And uh, it was actually 23.1 deaths uh, per uh, 1,000 live births. And we have made an enormous amount of progress, and there are people in this room, there are people across this city, there are so many people who have contributed mightily to the uh, progress that has been made, to the point that um, we now are at the stage, we're not at 23.1 anymore, we are down to 7.4. Uh, deaths per 1,000 live births. And that is enormous progress, ladies and gentlemen, although not where we would uh, like to be. Uh, our infant mortality rate is still above the national average, which is around six. Uh, and that's why we are launching uh, this initiative uh, stronger uh, together, which will tap into a lot of existing resources uh, in the District of Columbia because that is the direction that everything is heading. When you look at the Affordable Care Act, uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of effort being put into that, but it also will result in uh, the expectation that under the Affordable Care Act provisions and under the insurance that will be available to people, that folks will take advantage of those opportunities, especially around those things that we know will have some impact on uh, infant mortality. Uh, so you're going to hear today about the effort that we are launching, that we have launched. Uh, you're going to hear from, and I will introduce them uh, in just a second, but you're going to hear about our commitment uh, to bring infant mortality uh, down by uh, 2020 to five. And if we can get there, I actually think we can do better than that, to tell you the truth. But that is a commitment that we're making uh, at this point. And if we can continue on the trajectory that we've been on, there's every reason to think that we can be successful uh, in accomplishing uh, that. Um, again, Stronger Together, one city for healthier babies. And I know everybody will remember uh, all of those words, uh, right? Um, you're going to hear from some, some people today who are experts uh, on this issue. It's a public-private partnership. Uh, we were in uh, New York. Um, one of our panelists and our deputy mayor and I were in New York earlier this week, uh, and we have a panelist with us who is with the Clinton Go Global Initiative. Uh, we were there to, um, to make a commitment, and we were happy to be uh, accepted. Aegis Health uh, was there with us, and one of our panelists, of course, is with Aegis Health uh, Security as well. And the commitment that was made was what you just heard. And as far as I know, and I could be wrong, I think this is the only domestic commitment that has been accepted uh, by the, the uh, Clinton Global Initiative in the 10 years that it's been in existence. And as I heard from Hillary Clinton at this meeting, there have been 3,100 plus uh, commitments that have been made and that have been accepted. So we're proud to be, if not the only, certainly one of the few. Uh, We're proud to be one of the few that's been accepted. And frankly, I think this is going to be successful and I think it's going to bring uh, enormous attention to the District of Columbia. And I want to underscore too that we know we are building. That's where I started. We're building on efforts that have been made over a number of years uh, through programs that we've operated in the District of Columbia. I think most folks know that they have been supported by federal dollars. Uh, and unfortunately, those federal dollars are disappearing. Uh, there's nothing that we can do about that. A lot of it has to do with the Affordable Care Act. But we're going to continue um, tapping into existing resources in the city and organizing those resources a little bit differently uh, to be able to address uh, the problem of infant mortality in the District uh, of Columbia. Before I introduce the speakers to you, we have a PSA uh, that was put together by our Department of Health. Um, 
guess we still call them PSAs, right? Yeah, I yeah. think so, sir. So this, was, this is a really long piece, so settle back. It's a full 40 seconds, I think, uh, that this, this thing runs, and then I'm going to introduce our panel. Hi, I'm Vincent C. Gray, Mayor of the District of Columbia. Keeping your baby safe and healthy is the best gift that you can give them. You can help your baby live a long and healthy life even before they're born by making sure you see your doctor within the first three months and throughout your pregnancy. Schedule early and ongoing health checkups for your baby and provide them a safe sleeping environment. Use minimal bedding. Keep the room temperature cool and comfortable. Place your babies to sleep on their backs and don't co-sleep or share a bed with an infant. Help your baby reach their first birthday safe and healthy. Uh, we have today some very distinguished uh, experts uh, to talk to you. I'm not going to uh, give really the, the extensive uh, introduction that they deserve. I'm going to truncate that so that we can get to the meat of the subject. But the first speaker will be uh, our Director of Health, uh, and that is Dr. Joxel Garcia, who we're really proud of uh, being um, our Director of Health. Uh, Dr. Garcia has a very distinguished uh, career. He uh, was, at one time, the uh, Assistant Secretary for Health. I think he was assist 13th Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, serving in the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services, um, and uh, has also served as the Commissioner uh, for Public Health for the state of Connecticut. And I understand that you actually had a rank when you, uh, you were the rank of admiral. Yes, sir. You should have kept that, man. That's a pretty good time. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to hear from Admiral Garcia uh, first uh, today. And following that, we're going to have uh, Dr. Tamika uh, Augusti, who's the director of OBGYN simulation uh, with MedStar of, uh, the, at the Washington Hospital Center. Uh, Dr. Augusti has uh, been in practice for 10 years, uh, nine of which uh, you've served, I think, uh, women in uh, Southeast Washington, mm -hmm. uh, where mm -hmm. we know infant mortality has been a uh, huge uh, challenge. Um, we're also going to hear from uh, Remy Shakir. She was with us. Uh, she's the principal with Aegis Health Security. She was with us this week at the Global, Clinton Global Initiative uh, in New York and was there with us as we made the commitment uh, to move in the direction uh, that we, uh, we're moving in. Um, I guess she's, she's also co-founded three high-tech companies uh, with uh, enormous success connected with NASDAQ and Fortune 500 and so on and so forth. Um, then we're going to hear from Ryan Springer, who is our senior uh, deputy uh, director for the D.C. Department of Health in the Community uh, Health Administration. Um, he oversees a number of bureaus, including Nutrition and Physical Fitness, uh, Perinatal and Infant uh, Health Bureau, uh, the Child, Adolescent, and School Health Bureau, Cancer and Chronic Diseases, and of course the Primary Care Bureau. And, and uh, two of those obviously have extraordinary significance for what we're talking about uh, today. Then we're going to hear from Fernando Arias, who is the manager for Global Health Systems the, uh, with the Clinton uh, Global Initiative and the director of the uh, strategic initiative at, Amer at the American Society of uh, Interior uh, Designers. Prior to joining his current organization, he managed uh, strategic relationships uh, at the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, engaging in cross-sector uh, leadership uh, in meaningful projects. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, it's always good to be involved in a meaningful project <laughs> <laughs> involving uh, global health and the uh, built uh, environment. And um, so I think, that, I think that's our panel. And uh, we're going to start. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Garcia if he will open up. We're going to give, I've already forewarned them, they will have about uh, eight, seven to eight minutes uh, to do a presentation. They can do it from their seats or from where I'm standing if they wish. And I've already forewarned them that I brought my hook uh, with me and that they will be subject to the hook <laughs> if they uh, substantially exceed their time. Dr. Garcia. Thank you, sir. If you want, I can speak from here. If you wish. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, first of all, thank you for being here, all of you. Um, 
Uh, let me just give you a quick history, and I'm going to take less than the seven minutes that have been allocated to, um, because I want the technical people also to, to talk about the specifics of some of the things that we're doing. Uh, but first, when I met the mayor, um, I, I met the mayor through Bibi uh, Otero, the deputy mayor, which is here, and, uh, and the former uh, director, um, Dr. Levin, and we were just talking about healthcare systems and statistics and data, and, and I had the privilege of meeting then the mayor. And two issues that immediately he brought to, the, to my attention was the infant mortality rate in the district and the HIV rates in the district. So I have worked for three presidents, two governors, two secretaries, and I always very proud of the people I have worked in terms of the knowledge that they have and the leadership skills. But this is the first time that I work with a person that not only had the leadership skills and, and the knowledge, but also had the passion and the understanding of what was happening with the numbers and the data that he had been presented. And I say that in, not only in, in a very honest way, in a very humble way, because anytime that I send some information to the mayor and the deputy mayor, uh, he sends it back with all these marks and questions and comments and corrections. And, uh, and all of that, that is based also on his science background. Um, we have people from GW here. He's a graduate from GW. Uh, and I, I, I still remember, I, I went back after I met the mayor and I, I was living with my mom. So I, I told my mom, mom, I, you know, it's, it, this is amazing. This gentleman that I have seen on TV, on the news, really knows essentially what's happening, not only in the district, but in, in, in the communities at the most microscopic level. So from that moment on, when I started meeting with my, my staff and, and the team that we brought in, it, it was a match making heaven. We, I'm very proud of the staff at DOH that has worked so closely and so many long hours. Um, all of you, I, I, I thank all the people at DOH that are here, but I also thank all the partners that we got and we actually start interacting how we can look at the data in a completely different way to find out what we can do that is different. And now I'm very proud to say that not only that we have the analytics to identify what are the issues, but now we have come up with the science and the proven uh, te techniques to resolve this matter. So we are looking, like the mayor said, to drop this to 5.0. But in reality, what we want to do is to drop the health disparities that are affecting our district and because 50% of the deaths of the African-American infants in this district are secondary to health disparities. And there's no excuse for us to eliminate preventable uh, death. As an OBGYN, I take this very personal. You're going to hear from the panel, and they're going to tell you some of the technical things from health equity to IT to a public-private partnership to the CGI efforts and all that. But this is a commitment that I, I want everybody to understand that the same way, way the mayor has convinced me and convinced the entire team to support him on this, this is something that we're launching nationally. Uh, the mayor and the deputy mayor are going to be launch, launching this at WHO PAHO next week. And this is just going to get alive by itself. And the best place to start is with the nation's capital the 51st state that should be the first state of the nation. And I call my, my boss, and this one. And I, you know, campaigning for statehood for me is like inborn with me. I come from Puerto Rico. We have been fighting for statehood for years, and I come here to, to fight for statehood. So <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I, I just wanted to, to let all of you know that we need all your help. And, pay it forward. We are going to have a campaign that we're going to be launching also, which is Rattle for Children, Rattle for Babies. And essentially, we are going to be launching this in the DC United game. So every time you see a pregnant mom, you rattle for her. Every time that you see an infant, rattle for him or her, because it shows that we are going to be supporting them. With that, Mayor, I, I, I give it back to you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. We'll now move to uh, Dr. Augusti. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you heard a little bit about, uh, about me and where I come from, but I want to let you guys know that I've been a resident of the district for 18 years. I moved here to go to school. I did my training in OBGYN here in, in the district at Georgetown, and I continue to work here in the district. And I'd like to share with you the fact that you can hear this panel, you can hear the stories, you can hear from the Department of Health and from government, but from someone who has, quote unquote, boots on the ground and front line, this problem is very, very real. I was very fortunate for nine years of my 10 years out in practice. I practiced at Congress Heights Health Center in Southeast DC on Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. And the patients, the, the women I took care of, all my patients, were amazing women, but there's a problem. Dr. Garcia alluded to the health disparities. And so that this is not a fallback or a sellout, but this is real. I want to share with you that, the, that you guys, everyone here in the district should feel very, very comfortable. We have amazing providers here in the District of Columbia. That's not the problem. We have amazing facilities, hospitals, first class in this region here in the District of Columbia. That is not the problem. We have to figure out a way to help these women. And through this project, we are outlining the ways that we can effectively help these women. Whether it's, and it's part of it, is helping the physicians help the women, if that makes sense. We all are very dedicated to the patients that we see. There are time constraints, there are resources constraints, and with this partnership and this program, hopefully those will go away. Part of the problem, one of the biggest things, and as an OBGYN, this is close and dear to my heart as well, is the access to care. There are so many resources for pregnant women in this city. Some of them don't even know about the resources that are there. Some of them, there's a lot of red tape to get to those resources. And this partnership and this program is gonna knock that down. Certain medications that these women can take, that can get to help prevent early preterm births has been in the past problematic especially navigating through the system here in the District of Columbia. However, the Affordable Care Act is going to help that. We're on the path to, to correct this. This is an amazing program, and I think that the partnership is the right mix. It's going to work, and I, I promise to the panel, to the mayor, to you guys, that I'm going to do everything I can as frontline, getting more providers involved, recognizing the problem, getting our great in hospital institutions here in this city involved so that we can absolutely reach our goal by 2020. And like Mayor Gray said, I think we can do better than that. And I, we will do better than that. So thank, thank you. you. All right, that obviously is extremely encouraging, especially for some, from someone who has been uh, in the trenches, uh, working hard to be able to improve outcomes for moms and especially uh, for our babies uh, here in the city and to try to get them through that uh, sometimes tough period of uh, the first year. All right, Remy, we're gonna turn to you uh, now uh, and then we'll do Ryan uh, after that. We're gonna hear about Aegis Health Security and what their uh, participation will be uh, in this effort. Thank you very much, Mayor. And I really do appreciate the Mayor's uh, leadership and support and energy and that of uh, Bibi Otero and in particular her right hand Christian Barrera who have been the ones to make this a reality from the political uh, support and, and really taking a stand here in the district for making this as a success story about the Affordable Care Act and understanding that there's a a massive transformation going on nationally but here in our district we can take this one uh, use case, if you will, being infant mortality and come up with a model for the district to attract or to attack other challenges in the health sector, whether that's HIV or diabetes, asthma, et cetera, but creating a framework for public-private partnerships and being able to enable the district to transition some of the roles and functions into the private sector and create a collaboration with the private sector to, to show how Yes, you can improve outcomes. Yes, you can create healthcare savings. Yes, you can deliver better, uh, more efficient care. 
And the other aspect is really looking at the role of technology. And so with Aegis Health Security, we came in as a consultant or a, a partner with the district to identify what are the drivers of infant mortality here? What are the population factors? Where are the moms falling through the cracks? And then as Dr. Tamika August uh, mentioned, for all of the robust services that exist here in the district, what's preventing the mom from accessing the services that are already available? And the district is enviable in having such a high percentage of uh, residents who are covered with health insurance, whether that's public or private insurance. So access to care isn't the issue. It's really understanding where does the district put its program dollars and its resources. How do you better connect the public and private sector services and get those um, available to whether it's a mom or the baby or other residents of the, of the district to be able to connect and improve their health and reduce health disparities, or the other way of looking at it is to create that health equity. And when you look at health equity, it means that no matter how much money you have or don't have or where you live in the district, everybody should have access to the services that they need so that they're accountable and empowered with their health and at the same time that everybody's doing what they should be doing. I do come from the private sector and I look at uh, efficiencies and innovations that the private sector is coming uh, to market with and how those can be shared with the public sector, whether that's DOH or behavioral health or healthcare finance. There are all of these agencies that can come together and work together more efficiently and, and work with the private sector so that as we're transitioning services out of DOH or one of the government agencies into being an accountable uh, service within the private sector, there's that, that tight handoff and there's that continued hand-holding uh, to make sure that the information sharing is there, that the, that the services that need to be there are, are available, that there's accountability uh, with the providers and there's accountability also with individual members for taking a stand for their health and in this case in the health of their babies. So we've been very fortunate to work with uh, the leadership of DOH and and the office of the mayor and deputy mayor to, to make this a reality. And again, we're <laughs> taking baby steps. So this is, we were joking that at CGI, we've, we've birthed the baby. <laughs> so let's get to year one <laughs> uh, birthday. So uh, again, it's been a pleasure to work with everybody and, and bring over 40 partners together to, to figure out how to, to make this as a reality of achieving our 5.0 IMR. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I want to acknowledge that I think the campaign that we're launching and the program activities speak to the idea of one city. It really does, because we cannot do this alone. And so we've built a framework around this campaign that looks at bringing our partners to the table, community partners, providers, mothers, their families in the community. And we want to make sure that the right players are at the table to help us push this agenda forward. And so you've heard the stats from the mayor and from Dr. Garcia. Uh, we've done a great job historically in bringing that IMR rate down from 21 back in 1991 down to 7.4. But the disparities across the demographics, uh, it still stands out. And so for the African-American female population, you're looking at 11.4 compared to the Caucasian population at 1.7, I think is a stat. And so this is what we really need to work towards is el eliminating those disparities and looking at health equity. And so when we thought about this campaign, we had 40 plus stakeholders working with us. We looked at the approach we wanted to take. And so we're looking at eliminating disparities across the system of clinical care. And so we have key initiatives and, and drivers uh, that we're working on in that regard. But we also need to look at the disparities across social determinants of health. And I think that's, uh, that's the beauty of this. We're not just thinking short term, but what are the long term activities that we need to engage in? And so right now we're looking at how can we specifically impact IMR? And as Dr. Garcia mentioned, I think we took a look at the data in a very innovative way for public health. And so we identified you know, four or five key drivers. We're looking at early prenatal start within the first trimester, ongoing care, reduction in smoking and substance use, um, overall quality, and we're looking at obesity. Um, and obesity has implications around bed sharing and co-sleeping and the SIDS numbers. 
And so we have a program specifically to address those drivers. Um, but, but as I mentioned, I think looking at health equity across the board and building the kind of infrastructure that we are through this project allows us to not only respond to infant mortality, but any other community health issue and need that comes up. We're building that infrastructure to allow us to do that long term. And I think that's the beauty of this campaign. It's we're really looking at the long term role of the public health inter uh, industry our role along with our community partners, and how do we partner together long term to address not just infant mortality, but other issues as they come up. Brian, thank you. Fernando. Uh, so just let me start out by saying uh, a very warm thank you to uh, the Honorable Mayor Gray and the folks at Aegis Health. Uh, Remy and Mark for inviting me to lend my voice and my perspective on both the commitment and the overall picture of how CGI um, helped to organize this great project and this great work together. So um, for folks that don't know much about CGI, let me just take a moment to sort of explain to you why it matters that Clinton Global Initiative is a, is a strong platform for um, this commitment. So in 2005, uh, President Clinton in his post-presidency period was really uh, perplexed about how global leaders uh, were convening and there wasn't a lot of action being taken. And uh, I certainly uh, am a tremendous fan of President Clinton's, uh, mostly because he's a person that really um, champions this culture of action. So, you know, commitments are all about taking action on issues. And uh, since 2005, and now into 2004, um, there were 3,100 of these kinds of commitments. Um, some of them are global, some of them are domestic. There's different platforms for CGI. Um, but what's really important to note um, is, is that as partners convene uh, to take action, two key things lead to success for um, these commitment projects. One, um, funding uh, needs to be a strong component of the launch of a commitment. So if at least 55% of the commitment's funding has been raised um, or strong fundraising strategies in place, these commitments thrive. Um, and then the second is, is that you have what we call trifecta. You have um, a public, private, and non-governmental agents uh, sort of involved in administering this project. Now, let me focus that down to how this matters to you and why should you even care. Um, I think that um, this platform, uh, the Clinton Global Initiative, tries to really and, and succeeds quite you know, often in delivering real benefits to real people. And so with this broader question about um, why should we care about IMR or infant mortality rate, um, not only is it a strong indicator of a community's health, but it also is important to everyone on a very sort of simple term that um, it eases burdens on health systems that other people might rely on. And then ultimately also it creates um, greater economic prosperity and, and shared uh, sort of community um, sustainability by being able to include mothers and young um, children in activities that are um, successful in community development schemes in general. So ultimately, not only is community and um, neonatal health, maternal health important to this particular commitment, but um, it sets a precedent for the district to then be able to say, we created a dynamic structure, we had these partners, different folks put in different pieces to be able to execute the work. Some folks did a lot of measurement and evaluation, a lot of folks gave a lot of implementation on the ground, but we needed all of these different pieces in order to move the issue forward and achieve some growth, some success. Um, and so I think that that's kind of where we are now with this particular commitment. And as I worked with Remy um, in my role at CGI, um, I also developed uh, a sense of uh, commitment of my own, and so I transitioned out of CGI to go work with another commitment maker, um, because I think that the burden now is you get this really exciting party, if you will. You get all these great partners, everybody wants to take action, let's get to work, and then the lights come on and you're like, okay, well, who goes first and what do we do next? So um, all commitments and all commitment makers are um, challenged to execute these commitments in a very pragmatic, tangible way. And then CGI um, is a coach, if you will, for these commitments to sort of succeed by annually requesting progress and measuring 
progress based on the targets that these commitments set out to achieve. And so I think that this particular issue and the district will benefit tremendously from being on this now sort of regimen, if you will, through the commitment to action process. And I'm terrifically sort of honored to be part of that um, through my work with uh, this particular commitment. I want to thank our panelists for the uh, substantive content of their presentations, and I want to thank them for their brevity uh, also, because it now gives us a good bit of time for um, a kind of interactive process. Uh, we have microphones. I know we have one over here. I think there's one over here. I see the stand. I don't know if there's a microphone on it or not. Um, if there's not, we'll, we'll figure it out. There's, there's definitely a microphone over here. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. and. Uh, you know, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Garcia and you, Ryan, because you all are our public health officials who are a part of this panel. And then the rest of you can chime in, uh, especially Dr. Augusti, because you're out there in the, in the trenches, as you said before, working hard. But we've got a number of things to which we committed ourselves, all of which, you know, everybody, nobody would disagree with. You know, getting women into care um, during the first trimester, uh, but more specifically, we said we would have 78% uh, uh, improvement, I think, in women being uh, involved in the first trimester. And then uh, we would make sure that there's regular care, that not, it isn't just sporadic, that you do it, um, you know, throughout the entirety of the uh, pregnancy, that we would have 98% of the women who are pregnant not smoking. Uh, which means, by the way, that there's only 2%, which is probably 2% too many. Uh, but that's easier said than done. And by the way, one of our partners is CVS. And I want to congratulate CVS. For those of you who don't know, CVS is not selling cigarettes uh, anymore in their stores. And I, I hope that there are others who follow uh, quickly behind them because that will have uh, an impact too. I hope we don't create an underground market for selling cigarettes uh, in the city, but uh, this is a good start. Um, we also, you heard, uh, you know, alluded to, you heard uh, co-sleeping where in, in the relationship with obesity uh, as well uh, mentioned in that process. Uh, and that is unfortunately cases where uh, moms, uh, sometimes dads, but moms in particular, um, and, and I mean that only because that's the, the, the data indicate that, um, that's where you see it happening, where they put the baby's infants in bed with them and then roll over on the baby and the baby gets suffocated. We've had, I think, six instances of that already this year uh, here in the District of Columbia. And um, the, the uh, other factors that were mentioned, but those were the principal ones. I want to start with smoking. Uh, I want to ask, uh, I want to ask Dr. Garcia, I want to ask Ryan, and then the rest of our panelists. And by the way, if you have a comment or a question, there's a mic there. I think there's a mic over I just can't see what's on the stand. There is not. Then we'll ask you to move over here, uh, if you would. Uh, or, you know what, there we go. We got a mic right here. This one here. Uh, if we can put that down there on the stand. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Frank. Um, but let's start with the issue of uh, smoking. How in the world do we get people to stop smoking? That is really hard. I at one time, it wasn't in the recent past, but I was a smoker, and I'm, I'll tell you, stopping smoking was a really difficult thing to do. Probably one of the best decisions I ever made, but it's a really difficult thing to do. Well, Mayor, one of the, I just came from the, the ASTO meeting where all the health commissioners and directors, we get together, and one of the challenges that we have in the nation right now is the increase of smoking. Uh, even though the rates of smoking nationwide are going down, in women, especially young women, the rates are going up. And one of the issues is the strong marketing that the campaign, that the companies are doing right now, associating that with uh, losing weight or keeping the weight that they have lost. So it's, it's a major challenge. What we, we learned was, for example, in states like Colorado, Michigan, Washington states, they have campaigns that the smoke cessation not only happens with the doctor's office, but it's also an involvement of the entire community from churches, temples, and synagogues, all the way to the supermarkets and the pharmacy stores. As a matter of fact, one of the discussions that we had had was that instead of having the patient has to go to a specific place, 
that the services go to the community where the patient is or even closer to her home or apartment. It's, it's, for smoking, it's going to be a sustained effort. Um, it's going to be not only to in the, from the moment before they are going to get pregnant and then try to get them to quit. And then when they are pregnant, then it's to the smoke cessation per se. Smoking, and, and this is what is so important, the, the nicotine per se is an anti-estrogen. So it's destroying the placenta of the mom. Yeah. So, and then when they have their baby, the other part that happens is if you have a baby boy that is preterm and they smoke, the problem is increase the chance for seeds or for uh, death secondary to cause sleeping. So uh, we are going to have an education, a strong educational campaign, but also an interactive uh, process. That means that not only we are going to help, for example, Dr. Agustin and her team in terms of supporting her take, uh, uh, processes to uh, have the patients quit smoking, but also we need the other community partners. So this is a cultural change, but if we don't do it, uh, especially in, in the district, when you live in, a, in an apartment building, when a person is small, many people are smoking. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so th that's, that's one of the things that we're going to do, but Ryan, you can go so on. Sure. I think it's important to note, um, when, we look at, when we looked at the data for smoking, you know, we found that for a mother who smokes, and for some reason there's a threshold around 11 cigarettes a day, and the IMR rate above 11 cigarettes a day shoots up to 40 plus deaths per 1,000 births. And I think for us, we've identified smoking as a high risk indicator across the board for that fact. And so I think Dr. Garcia said it clearly, we need to look at our opportunities for engaging the community so that we can prevent the start in the first place. And so even in our teen pregnancy prevention activities, we're looking at how can we work with these teens around reducing their start of these risky behaviors in, in the first place uh, so that we can stop this before it even starts. And of course, once folks are using, then we have to get into the behavioral health interventions. And of course, quitting smoking is not easy, but we have the resources through our partners uh, at DBH with the, the quit line. We have uh, treatment providers who provide that service, but it is a challenge. I think the, the way we win this is at the community level long before people even start smoking in the first place. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see much, um, you're out there in the community, do you see much incidents of women who are pregnant smoking? Absolutely, unfortunately. And these are women who have been smokers who can, before they were pregnant, and oops, by the way, they got pregnant. So there was no planning on, let me stop smoking first, let me get into better health, and then I'm gonna get pregnant. I, and this may be shocking for some, but that's the truth of the matter. This is what is going on. And it's particularly in our, in, in certain wards of the city where our infant mortality is higher, where it's predominantly affecting black women. This is what's going on. And so I really, really appreciate and like the fact that we talk that this is a cultural thing, that this is a, and this is not just a, a woman thing. I'm gonna set the stage for you. For example, if I capture that woman who is smoking and I know I, we ask, we ask every time, and they're like, yeah, I'm smoking. How many cigarettes a day do you smoke? Oh, you know, not that much. I only take a puff here, a puff there. Well, how many, how many packs do you go? Well, I guess, I guess like half a pack. So I guess of half, half a pack equals a pack, okay? So we're not, we're, they're always underestimating. And I may get her and I will educate her and tell her what smoking can do to pregnancy. And I got her. I got her for that, for that 15, 30 minute visit. I have her. Then she goes home. She goes home into that apartment building where every neighbor around her is smoking and the smoke is coming through the walls, okay? Or when her, her mother, her grandmother, her uncle, they're in the home and they're smoking. The father of the baby is smoking. It's all around her. How is this gonna work? I, I lost her, I lost her after that. So it is, it's, it, I'm glad that like partners like CVS make, are not selling cigarettes anymore. We have to address this problem so much earlier in any reproductive age woman and in our, our male patients in all of it because it's also, it's not what just goes on in the office, but it's when they go home that's gonna matter. Given those, which I, I think is, you know, uh, absolutely the case, given those conditions that you cited and those circumstances that you cited, I'm not just directing it to anybody that wants to chime in on mm -hmm. the panel, what makes us think that we can make a difference? 
that we can get people to the point where only 2% of women who are pregnant are smoking. What, 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 is, what is it we will do different, differently that will change that? I, I think from my perspective, it's the sustained approach like uh, the doctor just mentioned. She has a visit and then the patient is going to come back two weeks or three weeks or one week later, is that we have to provide some support at the home level. Uh, like uh, the doctor also mentioned, the partner, the husband, the boyfriend, the family members, that's a, a big challenge that we have here. So that's why this is not, uh, it's, it's patient-centric, but it's essentially family-centric or family unit-centric and community-centric so, because we are going to give the tools to all of them. Um, what has worked in other states is instead of having the doctor be in charge of that part, it's the community who is in, part, in charge of that part. And I think this is going to be more or less like uh, what you, how you succeeded, Mayor, with the decrease in the IV drug use for HIV by 80%. It was a community effort and also an access for being able to provide the program so they can easily understand and easily use. It's, it's, but it's a, it's a cultural change because it cannot be a DOH program and a doctor program. It has to be an entire community program. So, mm -hmm. well, One of the things I just want to mention is that um, the resources that the District of Columbia has is outstanding. And I think the problem to this point had been letting all our providers, our associated providers, our care teams, both in the offices, in the outpatient, in the hospitals, really know what services we have. I have to be honest, in, in, in collaboration in some of our meetings, I was myself was surprised at what services they were. And I've been here working for how long and I didn't know. So I think bringing that to the forefront, we had a lengthy discussion about that, being able to bring some of those resources into the, provide, into the different offices, our community health centers, some of our um, hospital-based community um, clinics, I think that's gonna make a huge difference. I mean, what the resources here are amazing. And like Dr. Garcia mentioned, the work that was done with the HIV, I, I mean, I don't, it's hard to put it into words what the Department of Health did with making all the providers aware of the HIV problem and what needs to be done. It was remarkable, it worked. It is working. There is no provider in the District of Columbia that doesn't know about the severity of our HIV problem, what their role is into making, into changing it, and the resources that are available. So that was ex that was done so well, and I think if we follow suit, we can be successful here too. What, what is it that the Clinton Global Initiative and Aegis Health can bring to the table specifically on this issue, and that is smoking cessation? Obviously, smoking has implications. Uh, far beyond just pregnancy, even though that's in, in and of itself is pretty important, but has implications well beyond that. So if we're successful in that arena, it will not only have implications and positive consequences for pregnancy, but so many other arenas as well. What can the global, the Clinton Global Initiative do to support this effort, and what about Aegis? Well, I'll answer it first more from the public-private partnerships. Again, this is about mobilizing partners for impact. It's, to Dr. Garcia's point, it's not a DOH uh, campaign. It's not a healthcare finance campaign. It's not a behavioral health campaign. And it's not a Georgetown, MedStar, or a, an Aetna or a Care First campaign. What we've done is, with the Clinton Global Initiative, created a platform or a model where you can convene the different partners across the entire spectrum. So you have a constellation of partners and agencies that haven't worked together before, truly accountably work together, where we have collectively involved the private sector with the public sector across the different agencies to sit at the tables and figure out that first, common sense, don't smoke. Common sense, don't smoke when you're pregnant. But really being able to understand this is what's happening here in DC. This is what the data is telling us. Now this is what we have to do, and this is what every single stakeholder within that constellation is responsible for. So DOH and behavioral health might have certain resources. The clinics and hospitals have, might have certain resources. The MCOs and healthcare finance have certain resources. The point was, was we put all of that together into one bucket, and we also created a level of accountability within the model. So I would look at Aegis's role as mobilizing those partners to come together when they had not come together before, 
have the leadership and the technical expertise coming out of public health, then also looking at a company like CVS who's heavily invested, this is part of their brand, this is part of how they're gonna do business. They have never really worked with public health in the, in the past. Uh, we even here for the Congressional Black Caucus, when we brought uh, the list of partners to the attention, the first question was, why would you include CVS? Because this is part of their brand. They're on the, the network of their retail locations touches people in the community more likely than you're gonna go to a clinic or more likely than you're gonna go to the doctor's office. And this is where the pharmacist and their resources can be on the front line. They can be the ones to deliver smoking cessation programs that it's convenient. And so there are new partners in the community that from the health system are untraditional, but they can come together and work with the district and work with the many different public health agencies in the district in a way that they've not historically done that. And that's also where you shift off the cost. That's where you have a, a for-profit company who's committed to health because they're gonna make money. Now let me add just maybe a, a couple of additional thoughts here to support some of what Remy was sharing. From um, my former Alma, my, my, my passion with CGI, um, we learned that some of these commitments need um, intensive uh, administration and uh, coordination support once they've been launched. So um, a common partner between the Aegis commitment and my new organization, the American Society of Interior Designers, um, is an organization called HIMSS, Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society. And they're terrific in being able to think through and create a rigorous set of analytics for um, disseminating information about the efficacy and the impact of this particular commitment or the one that I'm working with with ASID. So I bring that up just to say that in my work with global health at the Clinton Global Initiative, I saw a lot of different commitments all around the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but a lot of them also um, in Latin America, where we were looking at either HPV vaccines or expanded access to other kinds of uh, women's sexual and reproductive health um, pathways. What makes this commitment, because uh, you know uh, the mayor had asked, you know, what, what is it about Clinton Global Initiative that's going to help this commitment be successful? And I would say a couple of things came up, and one of them I'd like to um, identify in particular. This commitment has uh, one um, approach, if you will, or one element of scope that I want to um, highlight. It talks about educating families and communities on the importance of maternal and child health, health and how to access quality care. And so this word access, I think is pivotal in, in that all of the various partners on this commitment, whether it's the American Lung Association, CVS Health, HIMSS, like I mentioned, Verizon Wireless, PNC Bank, et cetera, um, it's different because all of these folks are coming to the table through the Clinton Global Initiative platform with a desire to take action on these areas and with an additional desire to learn to take back to their organizations collaborative institutional learning um, that is achieved in this process. And so I think that the dynamicism of this being not just a corporate actor or government actor, but really just a collaboration partnership, if you will, um, I think will go a tremendous way to making the commitment work. All right, we're gonna go to our audience. We have a comment or a question or both over here. I do. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to applaud you for um, always being at the forefront. <laughs> for always being at the forefront of anything that's healthcare related, and I know that's because of your background, so I applaud you for that. Thank you. Um, I am a resident of the District of Columbia. I'm a healthcare advocate, um, and I am standing today because I'm a little bit confused and a little bit annoyed. Um, I heard you say, um, first of all, it's Infant Mortality Awareness Month, and I don't see any information anywhere that states that. That's one of the issues for me, um, which brings us back to, there's always, um, we bring very important things to the city forefront, cutting edge things to the city, but we never connect them with what already is involved, what's already there, what's already working. We never bring the historical data together with what was already 
what's new and what's being formed. So what used to work never got linked to what you want to work again. There are new people who come into the city and they have these wonderful ideas and I applaud that. I think it's wonderful because we need new ideas, we need change, but we never link it with what was or what used to be or what did work. I don't see anybody up there, they say that the wards that are most highly affected are wards seven and eight. I don't see any representation from wards seven or eight. I don't know if anybody, wait a minute, you. But there are no community partners. Um, as a longtime healthcare advocate, there are many meetings that we've attended. There was the IMR. I don't know anybody up there who's been part of IMR. There are so many other things that we've done within the city. We were not invited to the table. I'm a little bit offended by that. There's a program that has worked for 21 years called the DC Healthy Start Program. It has been a wonderful, <laughs> amen. It has been a wonderful program. And I don't even, I don't know if they were invited to the table, but the consortium was definitely not invited to the table. There were some wonderful strides that were made. You made the, you alluded to them yourself, Mr. Mayor, that in 1992 it was 23.9. At this moment, it is, well, actually, we don't know what it is at this moment, but in 2011, it was 7.4. It very well could be much lower than that at this moment. We have not received the statistics. I am always offended by people who come and bring us information, but they haven't talked to us. Now, I think it's wonderful what you're doing. I'm not at all suggesting that this is not a wonderful program. It is, and I absolutely applaud it. Why wasn't there some kind of link? Why didn't you come to us? Why weren't we invited to the table? I am always, as a resident, a taxpaying resident, a homeowner in the District of Columbia, I am always offended that this information comes to us, we get it secondhand. I'm also, um, most of the people in this room know about IMR, and so for us to go through this dog and pony show offended me as well. I want to know exactly what it is that you are going to do that's different from what the Healthy Star did or what Mary Center did or what Healthy Babies does. What do you do that will get these moms into the program that we couldn't do? Thank you. Well, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, let me, first of all, I appreciate your comments and I appreciate your, uh, your passion and your advocacy. Um, and. Healthy Star was actually a program that was started when I was a director of the Department of Human Services. And unfortunately, uh, it is a great program. It has been a great program, and we lost our federal funding. Uh, the, the, this, is, this is what I alluded to earlier, and that is, I think with the advent of the Affordable Care Act, we're gonna see more and more special programs disappear because the expectation is that through the Affordable Care Act, people will be, uh, will be connected with healthcare initiatives that will improve healthcare outcomes. Um, I can tell you that we tried to keep the Healthy Star program going. As, as somebody who was around it from the very beginning, who supported Healthy Start and believes, frankly, Healthy Start made an enormous contribution to getting us from where we were then at 23.1 deaths per 1,000 live births down to 7.4, and we did go up the following year. We'll announce that soon. Uh, we went up a little bit, up to 7.9. But I think if you look at the 2013 data, you will see that it came back down. The issue is, how do we take the enormous uh, positive outcomes uh, that I know Healthy Star contributed to enormously and institutionalize them into the behaviors that we see across the city? How do we stop women from smoking? Uh, there is not a woman who you talk to who smokes who wouldn't agree that smoking is probably injurious to um, her unborn baby and they still smoke. Um, how do we get people to stop co-sleeping? Co because that is a factor now, you know, that we deal with. How do we get pregnant women in the first trimester uh, of care and then stay in that care throughout the um, duration of pregnancy? How do we get people to think about uh, obesity and recognize that it contributes to, um, you know, it contributes to a poor outcome uh, for their, uh, their unborn uh, baby? Um, so, again, I don't think there's any intent to exclude anybody. This is an inclusive process. It's one of the reasons why um, I wanted to do this session today. 
we actually were, which wasn't mentioned, we weren't given the opportunity. Uh, we, we were turned down from being able to do this uh, here. And I stayed after personally myself. Uh, in fact, we, we worked with the CBC Foundation and we worked with the folks who run the convention center to say, we want to have an opportunity to talk about where we are with infant mortality. We want to put in front of people some additional, I won't say new, some additional initiatives that we have that can move the ball uh, further down the field. So that's why we're here, we're here today. And really, we're kind of out in front of ourselves because there's an intent in the next week or so to really formally announce uh, where we are with this, how it connects to the past, and then what it is we're going to do to build on that. So you're absolutely right in terms of making sure that we connect the dots because otherwise you're just simply starting over um, you know, with stuff. And oftentimes, uh, you know, you're doing the same thing over and over again without recognizing the benefit of the past. There is no intent uh, to do that uh, in this instance. And I'd be the first one to say, that's why we're here today, to try to connect uh, the dots. I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Garcia, I'll ask Ryan, anybody else who wants to, to jump in to uh, add to that. But I appreciate your comment. I appreciate your advocacy also. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, in, in no way or form we were trying to exclude anyone. As a matter of fact, if, if by any chance you were not invited to any of the panels before, I would take full responsibility for that. We actually, internally, we have been looking to find out all people, all communities, all groups, including CBOs, religious groups, uh, leaders, ANCs, everybody had been, uh, been connected. If, if by any chance an email or, a, or fail, I take full responsibility for that. But going back to what the mayor said, yeah, it's, uh, you would be surprised. Uh, sometimes you, you would think that we are preaching to the, to the choir here, but you would be surprised how many people dismiss the issue of IMR. Uh, on the phone, I have been told several times by leaders in DC that this is not sexy enough to be talked be talk about. Even for this panel, this was not sexy enough for a lot of people. This is, for, for us in WHO, for us in economic development, this is one of the best indicators of the health of any jurisdiction. So this is not a pony show. This is just to try to tell people that this is very important and we are going to go to all, all venues. The mayor is leading the effort, he's, he's the face but it's the face that essentially is going to be transformed in terms of the face, it will be the district. So please do not ever consider that this was a show. This is really, we want to bring this to the forefront the same way that we did with IHIV in the past. It took 20 years. So all the things that are, are going to be done is including the, the red, car, red carpet approach for women in pregnancy, what we want to achieve now is we are going to force the system that within 72 hours of a person being identified as a pregnancy and she wants to keep that pregnancy, she will have been able to see a provider. And if she misses an appointment, she will also will have within 72 hours someone see that, that patient. So we are learning from everything in the past and I invite you, I mean, it's very, Easy to connect with me, jogsell.garcia at dc.gov. And, and one last thing, uh, sir. Um, Healthy Start, as a matter of fact, the district was not funded by the feds, and a lot of people know that. We have requested the feds to actually review our application again, and they agreed. So for everybody to understand that, that's not a process that happens in the federal government, but that's a good thing also to be four stars, sir. So, uh, so we, we, we have asked them and they are in that process. So I, I just want you to know, I, and, and one more thing, in the state of Connecticut where I live most of my life, it takes six years in the African American population to reach one year maternal mortality here in the district. So it's unfair. So for me, when there's a death, in, a death of a baby in the system in Connecticut, every doctor in that system is pulled. And we go on M&M, &M and we discuss the case. And if it's a mom, 
every hospital is involved. Here, and I'm talking as an OBGYN now, we have great doctors like Tamika, and honestly, she deserves a medal. But I have been presenting in some other institutions, and I'm not going to single anyone out. And the first thing that I said is the patient's fault. So I think that following the lead of the mayor, we are going to change this in a cultural process of change, and we were not excluding anyone. We, we want your help. Right. Thank you for your comment again. Um, and I want to acknowledge that, as Remy mentioned earlier, we just birthed this initiative. And I think the crux of what we were trying to do with this, as I mentioned earlier, is build a framework that allows us to capitalize on what has been done and what is going on. And so there's some elements of the program going forward um, around our advisory groups. And so we're going to be sending invitations to all of the community partners who are involved in this work to be a part of a technical advisory group. And so we have a five-year action plan that we've put together, and again, driven by the data analysis um, that we hadn't been done before. So we know what the drivers are. So our role, I see, as a public health entity is really looking at that data, identifying, okay, we're seeing these are the things that are driving IMR in the district. We want to bring that in a structured, systematic way to our community partners because it's not the... The resolve of this is not at DOH, it's at the community providers doing the work on the front lines. And so we want to make sure that through this data analysis, we've identified the drivers, we want to bring that to you in a structured way and strategically bring our partners together to respond to this issue over the next five years. So I apologize if it seemed as though you were not invited in the, in the beginning. We had initial partners helping us craft this, but we will be sending out invitations to our partners who are doing this work to be a part of that technical advisory group to work on the implementation. And just so you know, there's another advisory group because I know that we have, there are going to be several policy and legal issues and barriers that we face, financial barriers. And the intent is that we don't want to do this work, identify programming areas that we want to move forward on, and then we don't overcome some of those systems barriers that we know are there. And so the intent is to bring those identified issues up to the level of the mayor so we can have some discussions about how do we remove those barriers. So it's really, I see our role as bringing that system together, bringing the expertise that already exists together so that we can tackle this issue together and not in separate silos. Yes. Hi, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and distinguished panelists for uh, holding this event. Uh, my name is Edward Smith. I'm acting executive director for DC Nurses Association. Uh, we represent uh, nurses in the District of Columbia, including at the uh, Department of Health. Um, I have a two-part question. Uh, number one, as you know, uh, Mr. Mayor, and... Uh, can, can you uh, back up from the microphone just a tad? It's, it's sorry about, sorry about that, Thanks. Mr. Mayor. Um, as you know, uh, the... Uh, this uh, Department of Health is uh, uh, having layoffs of 33 uh, unionized workers and several management workers at the perinatal uh, infant um, health bureau. And uh, that work is going to be going away. Um, as you referred to, uh, the federal government has uh, not, not uh, uh, continued that grant. But that work is going away, and on October 10th, I believe is the last day of work of those 33 people plus the five, I believe, five management people. So question one is, on October 11th, what's going to happen to the care uh, and home visits? And question two is, from what I understand, the total amount of that uh, grant was 2.2 million, give or take a little bit. And we would like to request the mayor's office and the Department of Health to uh, seek additional funding through a supplemental budget or to move some uh, funds around to at least continue the program for uh, some, sh some period of time, perhaps pending the review from the federal government, which I just learned today, and I appreciate that. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Okay. I'll start, and then I'll ask Dr. Garcia uh, to pick up from there. Um, we, 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 we have done everything we could thus far to be able to have this grant continue. Uh, there's no way I wanted this grant continued. There's no way that anybody in the Department of Health uh, wanted this grant uh, discontinued because we know what a contribution uh, it has been, it has made to bringing down the infant mortality rate, and not just the infant mortality rate, but to health care and health outcomes uh, generally in the District of Columbia. Um, I would invite the union, uh, I would invite the Nurses Association to make its voices heard over at 200 Independence Avenue uh, to the Department of Health and Human Services because they were the ones that made the decision not to fund us any further. We sought that grant, we sought the continuation, we, we wanted to continue the services that were a part 
uh, of what has been the Healthy Start program now for 20 plus years in the District of Columbia, and we would deny that. You heard Dr. Garcia mention that we've asked for another review of our grant application. We have no way of knowing what the outcome will be, uh, but we have to move now to be able to address uh, the issues involved in that, and that's why uh, the, uh, the positions that have been eliminated were uh, eliminated. I, I can't make a commitment to say that I'm gonna go look for $2.2 million, because I don't know where to look for it at this stage. I mean, it'd be easy to stand up here, and people who know me uh, know that I don't make empty promises. If I can do something, I'll do it. If I think it's not going to happen or it's problematic, I'll say that also. And folks who know me, I've been in this community all my life. I've been in this city my entire life. And one of the things that I've been able to, to be able to continue the work that I have done for so many years is because I'm just straight up with folks to tell them what the situation is. I don't like the fact that this grant has not been continued. I think it was short-sighted. I think for those who are now arguing, as some are, that the Affordable Care Act will now expand in a way that will pick up these services. It, there's no transition plan that I have seen that would suggest that that will be easily done. There will be a time when the, the Affordable Care Act will provide more coverage. We have a lot of insurance coverage in the city now. We have um, 94, 95 percent of our adults are covered through a variety of insurance programs. We have 96 percent of our children who are covered. And it will be in a relatively short period when everybody will be covered. And one can make the argument that through that coverage, these services ought to be provided. But we aren't there yet. We're not there yet. But I can't, I'm not going to stand. It would be very popular to stand here and say and maybe get an applause line that I'll go look for $2.2 million. And then the next time I see you, you're going to ask me where's the $2.2 million. And the answer is going to be, I don't know where the $2.2 million is because I don't know where it's coming from. Our budget was balanced on the basis of the assumption that this grant would be continued. If you go back and look at the budget was adopted for 15, it will reflect grant funds that now are not available to us. So I would ask you and those who you work on behalf of to go to 200 Independence Avenue and deal with the folks who are over there because they are the ones who denied the opportunity for us to continue that grant. Dr. Garcia. Well, first of all, I want to echo what the mayor said, uh, amen. Uh, one, one thing that you have to understand how passionate I am related to this grant, um, there, were, there have been several articles this past year alone, including one in JAMA and one in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, to, in terms of talking about home visiting and the benefit that it does, not only for the children, but also for 20 years, the first 20 years of life, especially for an adult, including decrease in violence and decrease in other diseases. So we take this very, very seriously. One of the reasons that we had been talking about public-private partnership, and, and, and Mayor, this is something that we have been talking with the Deputy Mayor and, and, and your team, is that we, when we saw the assumptions of the Affordable Care Act, which all the great benefits it brings, it also assumes that the private providers at the, during the expansion will take over those services. And we knew that that was a challenge. It's going to be a challenge for all services that are paid by HRSA. So people understand that. So that's why we have been working since six months ago about Healthy Start. And, you, and the team here from Healthy Start has been very helpful to provide all the information, 2.0, 3.0, different uh, uh, op options that we had for the Healthy Start. The, and the same thing goes for HIV. We are right now significant challenges because the success is not pay with money, it's, uh, it's with costs. So right now we are looking to the public-private partnership as a way of funding part of it, but we're also looking at some other alternatives. Uh, my chief operating officer and Ryan have been working in a program right now in a plan of action to deal with this. I take every one of your jobs personally. And you're my neighbor, Robert. Uh, I actually told you yesterday, I, I brought the feds to my office yesterday. The regional administrator from HRSA came to my office yesterday just to hear from me that I'm not happy. So, uh, so I, I think that this is something that I like the idea of the 200 independents. Don't tell them that I agree with that because, uh, <laughs> but uh, I definitely, I think that will make a big sense. 200, if you go to the corner, 
in between D and Independence. That's the office of the mayor, right? The office of the mayor, no, the, the secretary. <laughs> and the not, not this year. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's right there. So you, you can, uh, don't waste your energy in the left side of the building. Go to the right side of the building. Uh, but seriously, this is something that we are working. I, I have talked with our union representative. Uh, I actually looking, I, we're going to have a meeting with all of you, including myself, because I want to know essentially what are the next steps. We are looking at every possible alternative here. And, and Ryan, uh, you can sure. um, As Dr. Garcia mentioned, we've been looking at all options, but we do face this current situation where the feds have decided per whatever rationale that DC would not be funded for this grant. And so given that, um, I want to offer kudos to the Healthy Start team who are here and not because the work that they've done historically has been phenomenal in reducing the infant mortality rate for those clients. And even knowing the news that, uh, or receiving the news that we did and not receiving this grant, the work has continued to make sure that clients received care. And so we're... <laughs> we're trying to leverage, and as part of this overall infant mortality work, uh, home visitation is one component of the overall approach, and we want to make sure that we provide a comprehensive program to district residents. That being said, the team has been working on how can we transition families to existing resources within DOH in terms of programming at the community level, as well as looking at our other agency partners who have home visitation services. We're trying to leverage the existing resources that we have as best we can while we work on other opportunities to try to continue this work. Uh, but I've got to say, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our clients are served. They're served with the best providers and the best care that we can give them. And so I, uh, kudos to the team for continuing. Um, the lead of the Perinatal Bureau, Karen Watts, has been meeting with us daily, <laughs> weekly. It's because of the work of Healthy Start that allows us to build a campaign like this and bring the partners to the table sure. so we can capitalize on that. Mr. Mayor, if I no, could just I'm have... going to, hold on one second, I'll turn right. I'm, I'm going to contact myself, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. But I'm going to make the argument uh, on the basis of the services that are so critically important as a part of this program and talk about what we've been able to achieve with this program over the last 20, 21 years, or whatever you know, length of time has been in place. Um, I know people would like me to talk about the jobs that will be lost, and that's an important thing, but that will fall upon deaf ears uh, over there. The issue is what services will be lost, and I want to talk about, frankly, uh, where is the train? If the Affordable Care Act is the reason why uh, people are saying we don't need Healthy Start funding to this extent anymore, then somebody explain to me what the transition plan is that will allow people to move from the services provided through Healthy Start to a more generic approach included in the Affordable Care Act. Yes, thank you, sir. So just on this topic of funding, I want to be a little uh, clearer about how Clinton Global Initiative is involved. Um, let me just emphasize that Clinton Global Initiative doesn't actually fund projects, and I just want that to be clear on the record. What we uh, do see at CGI is partnerships coming together and creating a sustainable, dynamic public partnership structure that creates funding streams. And so um, just want to make sure that it's clear that what makes this commitment different is just that it's not relying on earmarks or other kinds of grants or other mechanisms. It's really driving um, an incentive uh, structure for all of the partners involved so that it doesn't rely on earmarks or other types of special grants in order for it to work. Okay. I see our mics are being removed, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to suggest that we're somehow trying to uh, stifle people's uh, opportunity to speak, so we'll put them back until the session is over. <laughs> Thank you, Daryl. I appreciate that. That would send absolutely the wrong message to people, you know. If you ask us a hard question, we'll answer it by taking the microphone away from you. Three fifteen. <laughs> so we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, Mayor, I, I would like to just add one thing, and this is coming back from the, the private sector and also the fact that we're really trying to structure this as a market-driven initiative. Market-driven means how do you create the transition plan from what the system used to work like to what it needs to work like. And this is a journey. We have a, a good idea for some of the partners who needed to come to the table. Some of the partners are not fully solidified yet. They're partners that 
we think should come to the table that maybe either haven't been invited or we're on a, a, a journey through their grant writing process, it's legal departments, et cetera, with them. Um, you know, we, we talk about a, a CVS, we're still trying to figure out what's their role, what are they committing. At the same time, we're talking to Walgreens. There's no reason that any stakeholder in the community isn't part of this initiative, zero exclusion. In doing that, bringing in the private sector, can we get home visitation out of Healthy Start and into the MCOs? Or go through the Care First and the Aetna and the Kaiser home visitation programs? There are a lot of services that exist already in the district that have never really coordinated with the public side. So we are creating a transition plan. We're looking for the input to create that transition plan. But with the Affordable Care Act, we're trying to make this commitment, if you will, a success story. Can somebody leave Healthy Start and we help them get a job with one of the MCOs? And that service provider is connecting with the patient. And we're using the mechanisms and the legal policy of the Affordable Care Act and the reimbursement through the Affordable Care Act so that there's continuity of service. There's improvement of outcomes. You're getting the shared savings. Ed, I would invite you to join me in work, trying to work and do whatever we can with the Department of Health and Human Services to be able to, um, to change their position, their decision on this grant. It certainly wasn't ours, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't see it coming, I'll be honest with you. I just really thought that we had done such a good job over all these years with that program that it would be a slam dunk, that it would be continued. So um, this hit us pretty hard. Uh, as well to have to uh, deal with something like this and if we can possibly get it restored uh, I'll be ecstatic but I don't want to I don't want to create false hopes either. Yeah. We are very concerned with what's going to happen on October 11th. I thank you for your suggestion about uh, working uh, with the feds. And if there's any meetings that you'd like to, uh, to attend with you or okay. Ms. Otero, we would be happy to. We appreciate that very much. Uh, as I indicated, we didn't anticipate this. We really thought we were beginning to build upon the progress that had been made. Now we're trying to figure out how we scramble and make sure we can um, address the gap that's being created as a result of the loss of these uh, federal dollars. I'm not sure, I'm sure that people in this room do know this, but I'm not sure everybody knows that the Department of Health is 80% um, federally funded, which means that when we lose dollars, we don't really have a capacity then to be able to just fill the gap because so much of the department is funded by the federal sector um, in the first place. Yes. My name is uh, Lupa Kualalao, and I happen to enjoy the opportunity to have been the first nurse in DC Healthy Start, and to be able to tell you in a bit what the program really meant to me, also as a resident of the District of Columbia. With all said, with my concern, what I'm asking now is that whatever money is being given to AGs and the other programs, that the MCO, that will be picking up from where Healthy Start is living. Couldn't that same fund be also appropriated to Healthy Start to continue what he's doing? Because all these other MCOs, they've come and gone. We've seen quite, an, I have seen quite a number of them. I have had to see, to experience one particular patient that I cannot forget in my life. This patient was being serviced by MCO and, and uh, missed been seen because it was a, a Thanksgiving holiday, whereby the doctor, the provider, was out on vacation. And I was assigned this uh, patient. I promised my supervisor that if the patient did not see her provider, uh, did not go into labor, that uh, holiday weekend after Thanksgiving, I will see her first thing in the morning. I was there at seven o'clock on my way to work. I stopped and saw this patient, only to discover that this patient needs to be in the hospital because of, of her blood pressure. 
Is there a question in there somewhere? So what I'm, sure I'm saying is that now the MCOs are there because this patient also has been serviced by an MCO organization. So my question is that the, the funds that is going to the MCO to do the same job, to pick up where the where uh, health starts is, uh, is being left off. Can same funds be given to, M uh, to DC Health Start to continue the services that they have been doing for the 21 years to bring us to where we are with infant mortality? No, the answer is no. I'll give you, it's a complicated question that you've I asked, and I know, I know you know it's complicated. I know. Uh, but our MCOs, uh, at least the public funding anyway, comes through the Department of Healthcare Finance, and that is through the Medicaid uh, program. And ironically enough, 70% of the funding that we use for our managed care organizations comes from the federal government also. So the only way um, that we can get money to the MCOs are for specific services that they would be providing to the people who are members of their organization. Probably those who want to make an argument on behalf of the Affordable Care Act will say that the, the Medicaid program has been expanded um, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, that there are more people who are now being funded by um, Medicaid and, and, and as a result of the Affordable Care Act, and that people who have been getting services under Healthy Start can now go to their MCO and receive those services through the MCO. Um, I don't know whether I completely buy that or not, uh, but that is the argument that I'm almost certain uh, will be made for those who want to see this shifting off now to an MCO and Affordable Care Act um, initiative. So the same, uh, the same power that you use during the shutdown of the government, whereby you are able to appropriate some funds to keep the city running, is not, that's not possible to keep uh, Health Start running? No. <laughs> Make quite an impact. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it, 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 it isn't. I mean, the, the issue I think you're asking me is can we find the local funds to be able to pick up what the federal government has been paying for up to this stage? And the only way we could do it is really what I was trying to answer the question that you raised, and that is around managed care organizations that are 70% federally funded. But that would be a different, it, the MCOs aren't going to fund a program. They're going to fund a service that is being provided to people who are um, recipients of Medicaid and who are members of a particular managed care organization. It could wind up being the same services provided through Healthy Start, but it wouldn't be funding directly a Healthy Start program. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, but again, my last uh, <laughs> statement is that I hope and I pray that we're not going to go back to where we were before because these this, uh, residents of the District of Columbia had MCOs that were not able to meet their needs. Thank you. You're welcome. And we're not, we're not going to go back to where we were. There, there'll never be a day again in this city, uh, thankfully, where we would have to stand up and say that our infant mortality rate is 23.1 or 23.9 or whatever it was back in 20 years ago. Because I think we have, even though we haven't fully institutionalized these services and these behavioral practices into life for the District of Columbia, we're not where we were uh, 20 years ago. So I don't think there's any chance that we would revert to that. And again, this initiative wasn't designed to replace Healthy Star because we didn't know that was going to happen. Um, what, what it was designed to do was build upon the success of Healthy Start. Um, and now we're faced with tr trying to figure out how we fill the gaps that have been created as a result of the loss of a Healthy Start. And we will do that. But we're not going to look up. Uh, there's no way we'll look up one day and say, we're back to 23.1 or 23.9 uh, deaths per 1,000 live births. Uh, the direction we're going in is working uh, hard to be able to get down to five, and I think we can get below that. We were talking about some data the other day that if you can reduce the, uh, if you can reduce the uh, infant mortality rate by one and a half points, you would save $22 million uh, in health care costs. And I think, that's, I think that's probably absolutely true. Just think of the cost of smoking. Uh, for example, the health care costs that are associated with that, or the costs associated with uh, obesity, or the costs associated with babies that are born who may have some birth defect that they are, um, you know, that they're grappling with. You know, and beyond the dollars that are associated with this, think about the emotional toll that it takes on a family uh, to lose a baby um, before that baby becomes a year old, 
or frankly, the difficult emotional trauma and toll associated with having to provide care for a child who may have a severe uh, disability. As somebody who spent a, a huge part of my career working in the arena of disabilities, first of all, I'd never make the statement that I know how a parent feels, because I don't. Um, but I certainly have been around it enough to have some appreciation for the enormous burden and commitment that parents have to bear in order to address the needs of a child with a severe uh, disability. And we know that there are ways to be able to prevent that, and that's what we're going to continue to work towards. So I want to thank all of you all. First of all, how about a big hand for our panelists for us today? And I want to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank those who spoke and asked questions. I want to thank you very much uh, for being candid and forthright and uh, as we try to address the possibility of turning around this decision at the federal level, we ask for your support. Um, Dr. Garcia and his staff will be working on this, and I will be in the game, too. Uh, I, I, I've never seen a fight that I didn't like. Uh, so I, will be, I, I, have, I have joined in with this one, too, ladies and gentlemen. For those who know me, you know that I was an advocate most of my life. And all you got to do is tell me there's a fight going on over there. I'm in the battle. All right, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your day.